1. Context paragraph first. So I work at an escape room place, which already would probably can clue you in to what I'm about to write. We have some cool rooms here, very in-depth designs with a lot of immersion and narrative to them. More than traditional escape rooms. One of our adventures can be scarier than the others. Especially for smaller children. It has a bunch of darkness, a scripted flashlight failure, a dropped ceiling, etc. Sometimes kids have to leave halfway through because they get too scared to go on. So we always warn about stuff like that beforehand. We say that younger children may find the adventures as a sensory overload or too intense and whatnot. Which is a standard policy that's listed on our website and stuff. Okay, context over. One day, a particularly slow day at that, we had a dad and two children walk up and ask what we were all about. The kids looked young, so when I was explaining the rooms, I mentioned the standard these can be overstimulating or too intense for younger kids thing to them. They seemed interested regardless, so they booked the scary adventure. At which time I said more specifically that it was our spookiest one and that sometimes kids get scared of it. I told them that the other ones were just as fun and the same price, but they were content with the scary one. The dad just sort of nodded along to everything I was saying, so I assumed he was understanding everything. They booked, they waited, and everything was fine. When I was introing them into the room, I mentioned the fact that we had magic flashlights that are immune to any malfunctions if they wanted them. We always hand them our standard lights, ones with Arduinos inside, that cause them to flicker out in a coordinated manner. But in the case of smaller kids, we always offered normal lights too. They just kind of brushed it off, so I continued on with it. I put them in the room, closed the door, and that was that. Just another standard group. The flashlight failure is the first event that happens in the room. Literally, the second the door closes. I barely had the time to check my phone for emails before I saw the alert on the monitor that one of the exit doors had been opened. I went back to check and one of the kids had pushed out of the door, flashlight still off in their hand, and was crying. The dad looked flustered and a little frustrated, understandably so, and I did my usual damage control. When this happens, I first say that it's all scripted, there are lights in the room that come on in a minute, etc. Nine out of ten times it works, and the kid gets back inside. Sometimes I offer them the magic flashlight again, and they take it and go back in. But sometimes they're just done for real, and that's understandable and fine too, we never judge. It seems like this guy's kid was just not going back in at all, even though the other kid was alright. The dad asked if the first kid could just sit outside and wait for the adventure to move on to a less scary section. But the kid didn't want to go back in at all. I think they were like five or six at most. I told him that we couldn't have an unaccompanied kid in the lobby for 45 minutes it takes to finish the adventure, so he'd have to come out. This is not unusual, and we always offer free passes to another adventure when this happens. But this is when the situation diverges from the normal mental flowchart I have. This guy was pissed. He was having fun, so I get it, it sucks to have to leave 5% through a fun escape room. But he got nasty to an unfair degree. When I said he had to get out of the adventure, he started cursing. Like directly in front of his two kids. I apologized to him and said that I would give them all free passes to try another one of the rooms. We can't refund any of our bookings. I don't know why, but it's one of our policies. This, of course, was said in the booking process by the kiosk he booked at. And again, by me, before I put them in the room. We can rebook, but never refund, is the thing I always say when listing our policies. Something we have to do for every group that goes in. The dad then yelled at me for not warning him about how much it would scare his kid. He said it in that manner too, insinuating that I would know what scares his kid or not. He obviously didn't listen to any of the things I told him beforehand, because when I told him I couldn't refund him, he got even more mad. He said he didn't want the passes because he was not going to come back ever again. I was shocked beyond belief, so I was kind of just standing there, taking the verbal assault, just thinking of what to do. The kids were dead silent, I'm pretty sure. So much so that I think I forgot they were even there. I don't know if they would have wanted to go into another adventure or not, but the dad didn't really give them a chance to vote. He just left. 
I got him to take the passes because I said, it's company policy. We get in trouble if you don't take this. But he said again that he would never use the passes ever. Bro swore like a sailor in front of his kids and then just peaced out. Anyways, this is a PSA about opening your fucking ears. Do that. Do it, please. 2. So a bit of background first. I broke my ankle back in May. I have never broken anything before and I managed to break my bone in two places, so healing has been slow and new to me. I was told I needed to keep my foot up to avoid swelling, and frankly, you didn't have to tell me twice as putting my ankle down on the ground level felt like all my blood came rushing back. And it was going to explode. And so it was super painful for a while. I'm getting to the stage where it finally no longer hurts to sit up normally with my foot on the ground. And thank God, because I'm beyond tired of laying down. I can really only exist in two places in my home comfortably now. My bed and our couch. But moving me from the bed to the couch is a lot for both me and my boyfriend, so we only do it on weekends, and I work from home in bed during the week. So since I'm tired of laying down and now in a phase where I should be working on movement with my ankle, I have been sitting on the edge of my bed for a bit every day to eat, work, move my foot, etc. At my side of the bed is a giant window, and my boyfriend opens the window daily for me so I can enjoy the sunlight. So today, I had been doing things as normal, sitting on the edge of the bed to work and just enjoying the summer sun. I live in a condo building, so a lot of times kids will play outside in the parking area, and I hear them so much, not super loudly by any means, that I just zone them out when I work. I can see them sometimes, but most of the time they are over in an area I can rarely see from my window. My boyfriend had just gotten back from the grocery store, and he was definitely not in the best mood, since the air conditioning on the car stopped working, and it was painfully hot outside. He was mumbling to himself about having to go outside when it's a bit cooler out, and take a look at it when we heard a pretty aggressive knock on the door. Everything from this point forward is my boyfriend retelling me the story, since I was in the bedroom and not near the door. As soon as he opens the door, she goes off instantly. You need to tell that woman to stop staring at my kids, it's creepy. My boyfriend finds this incredibly hilarious, even though he has no idea what in the world she's talking about, and his first reaction was to immediately laugh and just respond, what? As best as he can without him losing it. She did not like this reaction, and started on a tangent, saying things along the lines of, it's weird for her to be sitting there and staring out of the window during the day and that she, me, needs to come out here and explain herself. And if I didn't come out there and apologize, she would report me for being creepy, and how my boyfriend was likely equally as creepy. My boyfriend was over this as fast as it started, and once he could pull himself together, inform her that I could not come to the door, and she needed to stop jumping to weird conclusions. Of course, she asks why I don't have time to come to the door, but plenty of time to stare at kids. He tells her I'm sitting on the edge of the bed like that because I'm stuck in bed due to a broken ankle and I can't walk. And she starts off about not believing him. He simply shuts the door in her face. He said she knocked on the door, on and off for the next hour before giving up. A little later, my boyfriend walked outside to deal with the car air conditioning and decided to look into the window I was sitting in front of. He said you can see me, but you need to get pretty close. And I'm clearly looking down most of the time, and when I have my laptop in hand, you can clearly see the top of it. He said it's more creepy that she came this close to the window to watch me. She hasn't come back again, and I hope she never does. We have window shades that slide down from the bottom and top, so we decided to switch them so this weird lady can't look inside. Just a bit sad, because I did enjoy having the trees visible in the background while I worked. Update this morning, my boyfriend noticed that one of the older ladies from a lower unit was having issues with carrying her groceries in again, so he went to help out. Usually, when this happens, they chat for a bit about life. He mentioned our run-in with Crazy the other day, and she knew exactly who he was talking about. Apparently, she got into a spat with another unit over their numbered parking spot. She was parking in it, and they had been pretty kind with warnings for the past few weeks, and never went to have it towed. 
she ended up hitting another car parked in the spot over, and then moved her car away. The owners of the spot are saying it's her that did the damage, and she's claiming it was them because it's their spot. The older lady knew about this because her son has a dash cam on his car. He has a motorcycle in his spot with his car, so he faces it towards the motorcycle. And it caught this on camera and the owners of the car asked if he'd share the video. Crazy doesn't know about the video yet, so I think the real reason she is concerned about me looking out the window is that she assumed I saw the accident and saw her parking in the wrong spot and maybe thought harassing me would keep me quiet. I'm not sure. I also was right that Crazy lives in one of the units above us and is renting it. When this car thing happened, the landlord was involved and expressed that their lease was coming to an end soon, and she did not plan to let her renew. I have a feeling we won't have to deal with Crazy for long. Despite this, we did call and report it to our condo association just in case, and they are usually pretty good about acting on stuff like this. We haven't seen her since, but we are absolutely having a blast hanging subtle meme signs in the window. Three. I'll try to keep this short, because this is literally about to start up. I have a best friend, 33 female, who has a mother that is a pure narcissist. A handful of examples. Karen made Tara aware that she only had her to lock down Kevin, who she stole from another woman. She cut Tara's older sister out, the one that Kevin had with the first partner. Karen has also had her removed from their joint will and other nasty stuff. She told Tara that if she didn't abort her daughter, she wouldn't be happy, and has proceeded to withhold money because of this inheritance, and caused numerous arguments. Inheritance was given to both her siblings, who were also made to lie about it to her face for five years, until it came out during a family argument. Enough money for them to buy a house outright. Yeah, it was a lot. She purposely puts her foot down in family chats with comments such as, Are you sure you can afford that? Tara has done nothing but work her arse off since she became a mum and barely relied on anyone, if I'm honest. During the pandemic, she was a frontline worker and her kids went to school with her. The entire lockdown, Karen went mental because myself and Tara formed a support network so I could help with childcare or just generally give her a break. Karen point-blank refused to even see them through a window, but kicked up a right fuss that we were allowed in Tara's back garden. There's a lot more, but I need to keep this short and be careful the siblings don't find this. I've witnessed a lot of it, I've heard the voice notes and seen the messages. I've been there when she's been saying vile shit about Tara's daughter. Most recently, this is what sent me on this path. Tara was rushed to the hospital by ambulance after collapsing at home. She is fine now, and Karen stayed home with Tara's daughter. Tara has an elder son, 10, and a younger daughter, 7. Her son at the time was with his dad. Karen called another friend of mine in Tara's and offered her £50 to watch Tara's daughter. Karen lives about 10 minutes from Tara's house. Mutual friend lives in another area altogether. Mutual friend was happy to have Tara's daughter because she knows how Karen treats her, but the sheer audacity of Karen paying people to watch her granddaughter is just beyond me. Anyway, I just want to say now that I am somewhat evil and quite enjoy watching people get their comeuppance. My brain truly works on some next-level hype of how to twist and fuck with people. I imagine it's because I spend most of my education years being the target for everyone, so I choose to retaliate with mental torment a lot of the time. Harder for them to prove I have done anything at all, unlike them punching me and it being visible. On with the petty revenge. Karen is balding. Yes, it's true. Her hair has had enough of her and is slowly vacating her round little head. I caught on to this when Tara told me about it a few weeks ago, and in my merry little stoner state, I formulated a plan. Karen is going to receive several toupee samples in the post soon, with a professional letter just explaining that we're sending them as a courtesy, because she's previously signed up to receive promotional material through one of the many websites she uses. Tara is getting her father Kevin in on this, so he will know. Not only will Karen receive these samples, but she will also get a link to a website that I've been making that has all sorts of information about thinning hair, etc. And a contact form. I cannot wait to see if she emails through. 
She is one of these people that would send an essay of a complaint over her parcel arriving two minutes outside of the delivery window. I'm working on this, and I will post updates when it gets going. The plan is to start sending things in the next couple of weeks. It won't just be toupee samples, mind you. I'm going to include actual legitimate leaflets about hair transplants, too. Doubt it will stop with the toupee samples and leaflets, either. She is currently on some health kick, so I'm wondering if we could do the Mean Girls thing on her and get some samples of bulking chocolate sent out to her or something. She has no major health issues, she's just a bitch. I'll keep going until she cries. You want to make my best friend cry her eyes out for months because she thinks she isn't worthy of living? I'm going to make you think you're going bald a lot faster than you actually are. 4. My soon-to-be husband will change his last name to mine after the wedding. All I asked was for a decision from him. I didn't care which name we used, as long as we used one as a family. I was happy he chose mine as it's easier, non-ASCII characters only and internationally pronounceable, as I have a job with English as a main language. I did not know his full reason. It's been two years since he decided, and nearly as long we had our daughter named after me. His mother knew, but apparently forgot since then. Thursday she was reminded, and yesterday, when I wasn't around, she flew at my partner. It's always been the husband's name, was her main point. He stood his ground. I love him even more for that, as he had some troubles with standing up for himself with his mother. We had a long talk this morning about all of it. His full reason for deciding my name, he loves how my parents raised me and wants to honor this. He cannot stand his mother's constant neediness and wants to distance himself from this. She runs into a problem, expects her sons to fix it, but if one of them would say no, she'd guilt them into helping. Her husband cannot fix it, obviously, her words. He could fix it, but for the last 30 years of their marriage, I know why he doesn't. Everything he does, he does wrong. Why did you use the nice dishes? Didn't you hear me? No, and you know he didn't, as he has a hearing aid he's not wearing. My soon-to-be brother-in-law wanted to take his wife's last name as well, but then both of them decided it wasn't worth the hassle. However, mother-in-law thinks he fought for his last name. Right now, my partner is talking to her again, trying to calm the situation. His dad is reasonable and understands at least. I want to help my partner, and I don't know how. I couldn't come with, our daughter is sick and he understandably didn't want me to. I'm worried for his mental state. He couldn't sleep last night, racing mind. I just don't understand my mother-in-law. It's such a weird hill to die on. It's his and our decision. He even said, to me at least, she needn't come to our wedding if she cannot accept it. When he came home, he left his spare key at their house and said she needs to sort it out. She said she now knows why it bothers her so much because she had so much to sacrifice as a young woman. She didn't even realize it's what she tries to do with me and him. We want the easy name. My partner said that this is not his problem, but hers. And then was told to have no emotions. I just can't win with that person. I'm livid. Five. I had just had to share the wild ride that was my mother-in-law's first visit to our house three years ago. Buckle up, because it's quite a story. To give you some background, my mother-in-law had never visited us in our ten-year relationship. She lives about 100 miles away and isn't able to drive long distances. Also, my husband wasn't exactly keen on having his mother over, but during the pandemic I thought it would be a good idea for his family to visit us. Little did I know what was in store for us. Our first planned visit had to be cancelled because I wanted everything to be perfect, and we didn't have enough furniture to comfortably seat guests in our newly bought house. So I rescheduled for my brother-in-law's 21st birthday, inviting my mother-in-law, his brother and sister. The excitement was building up, but so was my anxiety about COVID-19. On the day of the visit, we went shopping for goodies to celebrate, Given my fear of COVID-19, I bought cupcakes and individual Ben & Jerry's ice cream instead of a cake. We also got some meats for the grill, but things didn't exactly go as planned. 
To my surprise, my brother-in-law brought his girlfriend and best friend, even though he initially said there wouldn't be any additional guests. This annoyed me a bit, because I hadn't bought enough ice cream for everyone, but hey, it happens. When my mother-in-law arrived, I greeted her and apologized for cancelling the previous visit. Her response caught me off guard, though. She sharply said, I'm not here to visit you. I'm here to visit my son. I was taken aback by her rudeness and later mentioned it to my husband, who invalidated my feelings. We exchanged gifts, and here's where things got interesting. She brought my husband boxers and a purse for me. Now, I'm not a purse person, and my husband has already told her that. It seemed like a deliberate move to buy gifts she knew I wouldn't use, and then use it against me later, claiming I don't like her because I don't use her gifts. Throughout the day, she kept repeating, I don't know why you don't like me. It felt like a manipulative tactic to set the tone that I disliked her before anything even happened. It was a micro-manipulation at its finest. As I was inside making a cheese roux for mac and cheese, my mother-in-law decided to offer her unsolicited advice. She insisted that my roux was missing ketchup and tried to pour it in. I was horrified and had to physically stop her. Thankfully, my husband came in and put an end to it. She wasn't too pleased about being stopped, though. Another odd interaction, when she saw my husband eating leafy greens. He never used to eat them until he met me, so it surprised her, but not in a happy way. Her strange expression left me feeling uneasy with everything else going on. I chalked it up to pandemic-related stress and my own sensitivity. Then came the grand finale. When it was time to eat, I suggested giving our ice cream to my brother-in-law's extra guests, but my mother-in-law fiercely interjected and said no. An argument ensued over ice cream, of all things. She insisted that her eldest son, my husband, shouldn't give up his ice cream and demanded that he eat it. I stood my ground and told my husband that we should share our ice cream with our guests. The most disheartening part was how my husband regressed during this ordeal. He acted like a spoiled child and was happy that his mother was undermining me. He couldn't see she was undermining his soon-to-be wife in her own house. So there you have it. The first visit from my mother-in-law was a whirlwind of bizarre interactions, micro-manipulations, and arguments over ice cream. It was definitely an eye-opener for me and left me questioning a lot about my husband's behavior. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here. And thank you very much for listening to the Practical Proudness of Parents. Hi, Pop! Episode 113. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Before you go, please do poke the like button. It's been saying rude things about you. If you'd like to get the videos a little bit earlier, you can support me for as little or as much as you like on a monthly basis through Patreon. And if that doesn't tickle your fancy, you can also buy Hellfreezer merchandise, both of which are linked in the description. You can also make donations during videos like this one, or streams if you wish to do so. While this is never required, I do very much appreciate it, and it helps keep the lights from flickering. Alrighty, let's see. Do -do -do. I don't think there's any other business today, so let's move right along to Hellfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... What is for you the most recent moment where it felt like... As I like to say, someone turned over two pages at once. As in someone says something to you, they ask you for something. In the case I'm about to, uh, the example I'm about to give. Where you suddenly think, hang on, what happened? I must have missed something. Because it doesn't make sense. I recently got contacted by someone for a gig on Fiverr. And this person, I'm there as a voice actor. I'm, officer, I'm offering voice acting services. Don't get me wrong, as a voice actor, I will obviously process and edit the audio, give it a nice polish before I send it off to you, and I'm even willing, if you send me a video along, to try and match the pace of the, the recording to the video. Perfectly fine to do that. I'm not, at least not advertised on Fiverr, a writer. I'm not offering services as a writer, but I did get contacted the other day by someone asking if I would write their script for them, as well as perform it. Uh, we didn't get to the point of talking about prices because I just said to them, I think it sounds like you you need to hire a writer as well. I'm only offering voice acting services. 
so I was kind of confused by that. It sounds like I was expected to make the whole video for them because it was going to be a bad lip reading thing. Uh, obviously not the more popular one, they were doing their own version of it. Or I would have been doing their own version of it. Uh, and it's just an example of the, the kind of high expectations people have for very low prices on Fiverr. I'm there as a voice actor. Uh, you're welcome to hire me and I will take any gig as long as it's not politically related. I've had to turn down a gig for that I mentioned previously. And I will over deliver as I often do. If it's a short script, I do tend to over deliver. I'll give many variations because it doesn't take me long to record it. And I've had nice experiences on Fiverr and hopefully I had more nice experiences. But there is also the kind of choosing beggar type of people. Uh, thankfully, I get enough of the good ones to keep me on the platform and make it worthwhile. So if you're feeling comfortable, please do let me know some of your own experiences in a comment below. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.